Well, welcome everyone to uh, the first Idea Factory of the spring semester. It's really great to see everyone out here. It's a good turnout. Um, I think it'll be a pretty exciting event. Um, we're smack dab in the middle of the 2017-2018 uh, series on walls. Um, and as Franco pointed out, this is our first talk that actually is about actual walls. Uh, we have walls coming up throughout the talks in various ways, but this is purely a walls talk. Um, and I'll, you'll hear more about that uh, in a moment. Um, I don't have the full schedule for the rest of the talks um, uh, on these slides. Um, I do, however, have the next talk to announce. Um, it's going to be also another walls talk on walls and public art. Um, it's going to be an in-house presentation. Uh, Dr. Steve Coy, who's the Assistant Professor of Art and Design at LTU, and a, a artist in his own right, will be coming and talking about both his own practice in relationship to walls um, as a street artist, but also a little bit about the history of the wall as an artistic medium in street art. So I think that should be quite uh, good. So that'll be February 14th, Valentine's Day. Um, and uh, uh, in this room, C406, same time. Um, we will also be giving, uh, just a quick preview, again, I apologize, I don't have the dates here, but in March we have a PhD candidate from the University of Michigan, English department is gonna be coming to talk to us about borders and contemporary poetry. Um, and then in April, we have uh, the mayor of Southfield who will be coming to give a special presentation on uh, a book he's recently written about family history that involves, in this case, breaking out of actual walls. My understanding is his ancestor of his was in prison on many occasions and actually broke out of jail. He didn't know this until he was doing the history. And also border crossing. So it's a kind of nice way to sort of uh, wrap up uh, the series. I have a number of things that need to uh, be uh, acknowledged here. First of all, the College of Arts and Sciences for helping us with funding. Um, it's really because of the college's support that we've been able to um, offer our outside speakers a little bit of a stipend, which is really great. Um, the Department of Humanities, Social Sciences, and Communications has been supporting us from the beginning. This is our fourth year at Idea Factory. All those wonderful posters you see across campus and on our website are due to the departmental support. And then in this talk in particular, uh, I need to thank the Teagle Foundation and the National Association of Engineers. Um, as you may know, LTU is one of the few universities who's been granted funds from the Teagle uh, Foundation to uh, address some of the grand challenges that face human society at large um, that have been identified by the National Association of Engineers. And the way we're doing that through our grant funding is by looking for ways in which humanities and engineering can um, reopen or readdress some of these questions in new ways. So this talk in particular, having to do with urban infrastructure, it fits under that rubric. So we're grateful for their support uh, today. Um, and with that said, I will turn the podium over to my colleague, Franco Globo, who will introduce our speaker. It's a pleasure to introduce Francesca Landera and her talk about Roman walls today. Um, all said, this is actually the first talk about actual walls, not metaphorical ones, not feared ones, but actual ones, and beautiful ones. Um, so Francesca um, studied classical archaeology at Sapienza University of Rome, where in 2013 she earned a, a master degree in uh, with final dissertation about Roman tombs and funeral epigraphy. She then moved to the University of Milan, where in 2015 she completed a postgraduate school of archaeology and cultural heritage, defending a final thesis about the collection of antiquities located near the tomb of the Scipios along the Appian Way in Rome. She took part at several excavation projects. She spent eight years digging at the southeastern slopes of the Palatine, Palatine Hill in Rome, nearby to the Colosseum. She excavated the Etruscan site of Tarquinia in a Roman amphitheater in France. She has been working on archaeological service in Calabria, which is part of the Magna uh, of the ancient Mag Magna Grecia, Grecia. Grecia. Uh, for two years. She also worked uh, as an assistant archaeologist with Columbia University in Hadrian Villa, which is a UNESCO World Heritage site. Uh, near Rome, 
and the most important of Roman imperial villas. Just a wonderful place, and uh, you know we we yeah. have, uh, actually so many times Phil uh, told me about how wonderful was experience his experience with uh, with Adrian uh, um, uh, Villa. As a bigger feast, um, she is a member of the international research project uh, of an international research project called Electronic Archive of Greek and La Latin Epigraphy, whose main purpose is to collect and di digitalize the online epigraphic database uh, of all published Greek and Latin inscriptions up to the seventh century uh, A.D. She is currently PhD candidate in class six at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, one of the most prestigious academic institutions in the country. The aim of the project is to analyze the southeastern sector of the Esquiline uh, Hill in Rome, which can be considered as the ideal place to investigate the development of the cultural, economic, and social history of ancient Rome. Among their publication, there is an article about some freedmen's collective tombs in Rome and uh, a study on the archaeological area of the tomb of the Scipios. <coughs> her last research on the rediscovery of a monumental tomb on the top of the Esquiline Hill will be published shortly. And finally, Francesca is a good friend. She is an extreme smart, and she is extremely smart, and she has a great sense of humor. We share the same alma mater. We are both from La Sapienza University and a love from, for Rome, the city in which she was born and raised and in which I spent a great part of my life. So I cannot wait to listen to her talk about the walls of the city that in spite of many problems, I believe is the most beautiful city in the world. The only main divergence, but it's a serious one, between us is <laughs> She's a fan of AES Rome, and I'm a Juventus sport. And this is a very serious matter. <laughs> yes. it, is, uh, it is for me a great pleasure to introduce Francesca Andrea with her talk about the Arabian Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Franco, for your presentation. I would like also to thank Paul Just and all the Idea Factory team for inviting me. And thank you all for being here. It's really, really a pleasure for me being here, having this talk about the eternal walls of the eternal city, of course, the walls of Rome. So um, this is actually uh, a broad subject because the history of these walls will, uh, starts at the, during the, the antiquity and continues right up to the present. Therefore, there are many stories to tell and uh, there are many stories that surround in this topic. As an archaeologist, I will focus on the ancient times, and I will start from the Roman Empire up to the beginning of the Middle Ages. I will try to answer to some, uh, some crucial questions, like when and why did the powerful capital of the empire decide to build up its fortification? How did they fabricate this huge structure and what did it look like? How did the world change the appearance, the identity, and the history of Rome? To do that, I thought that it would be great to start from the present. This is the perimeter of the ancient walls reconstructed by archaeologists, but Rome but walls still exist in Rome, and they still shape the city, even if because of the urban expansion of Rome, it is now not possible to distinguish between what is inside and what is outside the wall. But if you walk through the city, you can see still, we can still appreciate and see long, long sections of this monument, which is still great and massive. You can still look at towers, gates, even if sometimes the urban expansion has not respected the monument. And you can see here below, but you, we will see it again in a moment. So in order to build streets, they usually literally cut passing through the monument with these arcades. Okay, 
there is a place in Rome where it's still possible to touch and feel the greatness of this ancient fortification. And this video doesn't work here, so I have to <laughs> skip. But I really would like to show you this video about the Museum of the Walls. Unfortunately, this is a little known museum by both tourists and Roman citizens, but I think this is a magic place and of course I suggest you to go and visit it. And In order to become more familiar with this monument, uh, that this is the best way to start our talk. Let the walls talk, <laughs> okay, the images. It is hard to believe, but scholars became interested in this monument very late. As Antonio Nibbi stated, Antonio Nibbi was an Italian archeologist uh, who lived uh, in, during the 19th century, and I quote Antonio Nibbi's word, over the past three centuries, scholars studied every single stone in Rome since the day of its foundation, except for the walls of the Eternal City. Perhaps because they have been forgotten or maybe because they have been considered less worthy. However, these walls testified more than anything else both the Roman power and weakness. And I hope to show you how these words are true concerning the walls. This is a manuscript written by an ancient pilgrim, uh, uh, an anonymous ancient pilgrim in uh, the Middle Ages, who was really accurate in number, the num the, um, all the towers, the gates, the, the merlons of the walls during his travel all around uh, the world, all, all around Italy and also in Rome. But we have to wait until the 20th century to find the first two scholars who deserve to be remembered for their crucial works on the walls. The first one is a British, was a British archaeologist, Sir Ian Archibald Richmond. In 1925, he wrote this, is this first monography entirely dedicated to the architecture of the city wall of the Imperial Rome. And his work is still relevant in many, many ways. And Richmond's work uh, has been updated and um, uh, enriched by another archaeologist, an Italian archaeologist, Luco Scozza. Luco Scozza dedicated his entire life studying the walls, every single section. He did not write an entire book, a monography, but he produced a series of articles dedicated literally to every single section of the wall. And what is also interesting to note, to remember about Luca Scozza's life, is that his grandfather founded the School of Art and Education in Rome inside that Tower of the Wall. And literally, Luca Scozza grew up inside that tower, so his passion for this monument grew up with him. But before the imperial wall, Rome had two other fortification systems. The first one is conventionally ascribed to Romulus, the legendary king who founded the city on top of the Palatine Hill at 753 BCE. And Romulus wanted to protect the, the village, the city, and he built this fortification. Actually, archaeological excavations uh, uh, according to archaeological excavation, it was not an actual wall, but an earthwork uh, made with trenches and fences which surrounded the hill. 
The second wall of Rome uh, was ascribed, is ascribed, conventionally ascribed to another legendary king, Servius Tullius, even if it's not possible, it, it's hard to prove the existence of both Romulus and Servius and Servius Tullius, archaeological excavations also testify the existence of this wall, and we know that this wall was built during the monarchy for the first phase, so we are at 6th century BCE, and then it was rebuilt during the 4th century BCE. And what is incredible, according to me, is that we can still observe long sections, uh, sections of this wall, uh, this Republican wall, walking through Rome. For, for instance, this photo shows you the, this long, long structure. This is the Republican one. And uh, it's close by the station, the famous Termini train station. You can see it if you go in Rome. Okay, let's move now to the, um, the Roman Empire because those walls, the, monarch, uh, the um, first wall and the second walls, um, remain the only fortification system in Rome. But they gradually lost their function and integrity, collapsing beneath the urban sprawl of the expanding imperial city. The capital of the empire was an open city and it did not require walls because the boundaries of the Roman Empire, the soldiers and the troops were enough to protect the capital and the emperor. However, nearly six centuries after the erection of the Republican walls, the empire started to weaver because of external incursions. Bar barbarians became a serious threat for the ur and the urgency to protect the city started to increase among Romans. And ancient sources are unanimous in attributing the first phase of Roman walls, imperial Roman walls, to the Emperor Aurelian. And we still commonly talk about the Aurelian wall to indicate the fortification of Rome, even if there are many different phases and repairs identifiable in the standing remains of the wall, but we will get to that later. We have now to start with the first phase, the Aurelian Wall. Who was Aurelian? Aurelian was the 34th emperor of the Roman Empire, and what motivated him to build new walls for Rome, for the capital? We have to consider, we have to distinguish both internal and external causes. First of all, the increasing occurrence of a large-scale barbarian incursions inside the Italian peninsula. Aurelian himself had to fight against uh, Germanic people, but he also had to set off the rebellion of Queen Zenobia in the city of Palmyra in the eastern part of the empire. So it was necessary to ensure Rome's security, its citizens as well, and it, it was also necessary to prove the permanence of the authority of the emperor during his absence. In the meanwhile, Aurelian had to face up also internal issues. For instance, mint workers organized an insurrection against the absent emperor and a huge turmoil spread in the city of Rome. So the building project also acquired the function to calm the, pe the people, providing regular and paid employment. For all these reasons, in 271 AD, Aurelian set in motion a project in order to construct new massive walls for the capital of the empire. But what these Aurelian walls uh, did look like? In, within 10 years, they built, uh, they completed an 11 mile long fortification system, which encloses uh, about five square miles area. And the walls were originally 26 feet high and 11 feet uh, thick. They were built with brick face concrete and uh, they also had every 100 feet high tower uh, 
a square tower and inside each tower there were uh, chambers for artillery and uh, there was also a walk, um, an open rampart walk which, f which went all around the perimeter of the, of the, um, of the walls and uh, it was fronted by this parapet topped with merlons and uh, these, these walls also have 17 main gates and 20 minor doors. Even if, and I have already said that, uh, uh, even if there are uh, many, many phases and repairs after the first phase of the Aurelian Wall, it is still possible to distinguish some traces of the first phase. First of all, we can look at the difference between the uh, construction techniques. The lower part of this wall uh, is without holes. Not the lower, I'm sorry. The, yeah, the lower. The lower part is without holes. And that's because the Aurelian wall has, uh, was constructed only laying the ladders, wooden ladders, against the wall. On the contrary, the upper part with holes uh, testified another phase, uh, subsequent phase, uh, and they built this upper part of the wall using the scaffolding systems. And so the holes testify, show the use of this scaffolding that was only used in a later time. But if you we look closely at this curtain, and I don't know if because of the light, I don't think that you can distinguish, but I can help you with the red uh, color. It's also possible to distinguish, if, and if you look live to the wall, it's easier, to distinguish the Merlons of the first phase of Aurelian Wall. But what did the Aurelian Wall do to Rome? Because in 271, Rome was a big, big city, a million a million, uh, I, I don't remember how many, but lots of people lived there, uh, thousands and thousands of people lived there. And what most the most important thing to remember is that Rome did not require wall and Rome did not have boundaries at all, completely open. And uh, there were lots of amphitheaters, theaters, monuments, mm, temples, forums, baths, whatever. And those kind of monuments represented the city, the essence of the city. But when the architects built the Aurelian Wall, those si si fortification system literally cut the city. And the walls redefined what was inside and what was outside Rome, cutting out lots of sections of the, of, the, of the city. To do that, experienced architects have to face problematic issues be between uh, the topography of the, the relationship between the topography of, the, of Rome and the future walls. The guidelines they had to follow were save money, save time, but still do a great job. And I would like to show you some examples in order to better understand what I mean with that, because it's curious what they did. <laughs> OK, save money, save time, how? Reusing a pre-existing building, first of all. For instance, now here we have uh, the ancient barracks of the Imperial Guard, this very, very large structure, square structure, and the architects uh, simply reused this structure, giving this strange shape to the wall, okay? And we can still observe this sector, this section on, of the wall with these barracks reused. But what is even more uh, odd is what they did with this amphitheater for instance. It was an amphitheater which embellished an imperial villa in the southeastern part of the city, and they re reused this amphitheater. They only closed the arcades of the amphitheater, of course, because they, it had to be a wall, so without holes, uh, without arcades. But they simply closed them, and, and that's all, saving lots of material and saving time. But they also destroyed lots of pre-existing monuments, the majority of which were tombs. Now we can observe this tomb, this bizarre tomb of a baker, 
this, and actually, even now, it's difficult for us, for archaeologists, to try to figure out what it is, because we don't know. But this, it was a tomb. Every actually built this tomb, but when the, um, the walls were constructed, they um, not destroyed, but embodied the tomb inside the wall. And here, we, you can see uh, the, a drawing depicting the, the gate, the Porta Maggiore gate, before the, the destruction, before the rediscovery on the tomb. So the tomb were not there, be, was not there because it was hidden inside the structure of the walls. But even more odd than spectacular is the solution adopted here for the sepulchre, to, sepul the pyramidal sepulchre of um, Cestius, Caius Cestius, because the architects here let the wall line pass through the pyramid instead of going around the pyramid. And actually, we don't know why they did it, even because the wall the, the wall walk here had to be interrupted by the pyramid, so it's not useful at all. But they did it, and we don't know why. And they also, of course, and we do know why they did this other, other thing, they wanted to use this huge mausoleum, the Emperor's Edra Mausoleum, uh, better known as Castel Sant'Angelo, nearby St. Peter Basilica. And uh, of course, they used it and, and they embodied the mausoleum inside the wall because they wanted to use it as a tower, as a bulwark, and we will see how much this mausoleum will became useful during several sieges in Rome. But uh, this is another very, very uh, curious uh, example. Here we have, um, <clears throat> there, were, uh, there was Fountain, a long, long fountain which embellished um, another private garden. And this fountain had niches and sculptures inside the niches. It, of course, it, the, the, the wall, it, this fountain has, uh, has to be demolished by, to, by, the, by the wall. On the contrary, the architects decided to not only embody the fountains, but also they decided to protect the sculptures and therefore they put softy sand all around the sculptures and inside the niches. And we know this because when they demolished the structure of the, the walls, they rediscovered the fountain, the niches, and the sculpture preserved inside the niches. And we can still observe the sculptures, because they are preserved at the Archaeological Museum, thanks to the architects of the Aurelian Wall. But the ancient architects uh, uh, that built the walls uh, did not only destroy it or include it resisting monuments, they also wanted to preserve urba ur urban infrastructures, aqueducts, for instance, um, managed to survive over the centuries thanks, also thanks, to the city well guarded and protected by walls. Speaking of which, I would like now to talk about the NAE grant, grant challenges and for engineering, and in particular about the program to restore and improve urban infrastructure in the US. I would therefore like to draw a parallel between the Roman walls and the infrastructure in many American cities. As we know, the latter is rapidly aging and failing, mainly due to poor design and bad materials, or a combination of both. Society, therefore, faces the challenge of modernizing such structures. Many ancient cities face the problem of man managing cultural heritage while maintaining modern functionality. And a good example of such a mix is Rome in which it, this coexistence is extraordinary. When the walls were built, uh, architects understood the importance of the aqueducts. Uh, here we can see the walls and the aqueducts embodied inside the walls, but not to destroy, as we have seen for the other examples, but to protect the aqueducts. 
and um, they did their best to make sure the wolves preserved and protected the water supply, <coughs> supply system. And this allows some ancient aqueducts to still bring water to the most famous fountains in Rome. For instance, this fountain close by uh, Piazza di Spagna, or the so famous Fontana di Trevi, or the fountains in Piazza Navona. Thanks to these ancient aqueducts, we still have water there. And good engineering, the architect sensitivity, and good maintenance, good material, ensured the preservation of the Roman urban infrastructure over the centuries, thus giving us, I hope, uh, a good experience and example for future challenges. Let's hope so. But let's go back to the walls. It is also interesting to notice how the Aurelian walls progressively acquired new functions. For instance, let, let's look closely to this inscription engraved on a collar on a Roman slave. This inscription, this inscription says, I am Azellus, the slave is the slave who's talking. I am Azellus, the slave of Praeactus, an official of the prefect in charge for allotments. I have gone outside the wall, capture me, because I have fled and returned me inside. This is also very important because it's one of the first examples where the name uh, Foras Muru, Foras Muru is, is inscribed and has this strong uh, uh, meaning. But the walls uh, also become an actual physical boundaries for men. In other words, Azellus would have become a fugitive the moment he set foot outside the walls. It, it happened during the 1st century and uh, he also during the 1st century uh, new decrees, decrees concerning the walls were um, written. For instance, uh, it was forbidden by law wear military attire inside the wall. You could not wear military attire, but only wear civil clothes. And you could not follow the barbaric fashion inside the walls. You could not wear breeches, boots, leather garments, or having long hair inside the walls. And uh, this sculpture uh, shows you how you must not look like if you wanted to go inside the city. Ab absolutely not. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Let's move now to the second and substantial phase of Aurelian wool. Actually, the Honorius wool, because another emperor is the protagonist of this second phase. And during Honorius' reign, the walls of Rome have been increased and became stronger. But again, what motivated Honorius to build, to make stronger these walls? First of all, rebuilding was undertaken to keep barbarians out again. The gods were the new threat for Rome, and the, pro the prospect of an extended siege was more real than ever. But restoring walls could al have also been used as imperial propaganda. Walls were, and they still are, an important instrument, political instrument. And for Honorius, uh, building this wall was an instrument to protect the city, but also uh, the walls were symbol of the empire's enduring greatness. Around the full peri uh, periphery of the wall, they, uh, they were, the wall, uh, Aurelian's wall were heightened, so from 26 feet to 39 feet high. And they also used brick-faced con concrete, but in order to, again, save money, time, and so on, they decided to reuse bricks from other monuments, for ancient monuments. Which is not easy, actually, because you have to remove the mortar from each bit. I don't know if they actually saved time, but <laughs> <laughs> no, because I did. I had to um, demolish a, a wall with mortar and bricks, and it's not easy at all. So I don't, maybe it could be easier to produce new bricks, but OK, they, they did it. <laughs> I don't know how. But uh, this wall, oh, even the towers were higher, 
so uh, 75 feet higher towers and uh, we have now in the second phase a higher open wall <laughs> walk and a vaulted gallery as rampart walk all around the perimeter and many gates were reinforced but they also had to close minor gates because there were too much gates. It was impossible to defend all the main doors and the minor doors all around the periphery, so they decided to close a lot of gates. And they had the upper chambers, latrines, uh, and, 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 and it's curious, they built these uh, latrines projected out from the parapet, and I'll show you these latrines. It is still possible to uh, experience uh, the and to feel the soldiers, uh, the feeling of the soldier while walking through this vaulted gallery. And I took these photos. You can uh, walk through this vaulted gallery uh, from the Museum of the Walls, and it's very great as an experience. It's very, very great because you can feel the monument. Uh, it is not possible to go in the higher part, of course, for, for security reasons, but uh, the vaulted gallery is great. But walking through Rome, you can pay attention to lots of towers and massive gates, such as the, uh, the Appian Gate. And if you only also catch these latrines, this is a necessarium, and uh, <laughs> the, it projected out from the from from the wall and uh, it was for soldiers in order to never abandon the war during patrol even not even for physiological urgencies so you could use this i think they're pretty useful possibly but okay and they're still uh, you can still catch them in some sections of the wall now, I would like to show you what happened in the generations that followed. And uh, Rome had to face lots of threats, lots of threats. And I would like to show you how walls proved its, eff its effectiveness in defending the city. But I also, I also would like to, sh to, to talk about these centuries, the 5th and the 6th century, because they were uh, important for the history of Rome, uh, we, can, we can say that they were a watershed in the history of Rome. The, they, uh, they marked the end of the ancient city and the beginning of the Middle Ages. And the walls not only witnessed these changes, but they were protagonists in this history. The fifth century, during the fifth century the city was sacked three times for the first time in the history of the imperial Rome. Three times. For the first time by Alaric, Alaric king of uh, Visigoths. Actually, Alaric had to try three times before uh, succeeding in entering in Rome. And uh, we also know from literary sources that walls proved its values in fended of several attacks because Alaric um, succeeded only with help from, of some allies from the inside the city. So actually it was not walls' fault if it succeeded in entering the city. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's true, we have to say it. <laughs> And, we have, and the same can be said also for the second attack, actually, because in 455, Genseri, king of Vandals, tried to enter again in Rome. He marched on the city, and the pope was very worried about Genseri and its army, of course. And so the pope, um, Leo I, implored Genseric not to destroy the ancient city or murder its inhabitants. And Genseric agreed, and the gates of Rome were thrown open to him. And he could enter, so again, not Wolf's fault. <laughs> but but Wolf failed in defending the city during the third sack of the fifth century. Ricimer uh, guided these huge barbarian merchant mercenary units and uh, he succeeds in besieging and sacking the city. He destroyed, literally destroyed the city. And the fall of the Roman Western Empire were, was very close, and the Italian peninsula would have soon be conquered by goats, by the barbarians. 
It happened during the 6th century. The 6th century was a, a very difficult century for Rome and for the entire Italian peninsula. A dark age, we can, tell, we can talk about a dark age because it was really, really difficult to survive during this century um, because of the Gothic Wars. The Gothic Wars lasted for 20 years and during these wars uh, uh, we have the, um, the Gothic Kingdom of Italy with these two uh, kings, Vitiges I and Totila then, and the Eastern Empire, Empire ruled by Justinian the Great. Justinian the Great wanted to restore his domain in Italy again, and to do that, he sent in Italy and in Rome Belisarius I and Narses then. And uh, they had to fight again against Goths. But why are we talking about the Gothic Wars? Because we know that one of the other protagonists of this history is, are the walls of Rome. And it is possible to know in detail the stages of this war, the role played by the walls, and uh, also some repairs uh, occurred, uh, made by uh, Belisarius on the walls, thanks to an ancient historian, Procopius of Caesarea. Uh, he was a late antique scholar, and he personally took part to the conflict and wrote the history of these wars. And it's useful, I think, uh, to see closely uh, what happened in Rome and how walls tried to defend the city again during these 20 years, reading also Procopius' words. Justinian sent his most talented general Belisarius to recover the peninsula, and we know from Procopius that the first conquest of Rome was not difficult for Belisarius, because, and I am quoting Procopius, when Belisarius and the emperor's army were entering Rome through the gate which they called the Asinarian Gate, the Goths were withdrawing from the city through another gate which bears the name Flaminia. They decided to escape, <laughs> and so um, once Belisarius gained the city, and they continue with the quotation, uh, Belisarius turned his attention to the circuit wall, which had fallen into ruin in many, many places. He constructed, and it, this is really curious, and it's a pity that we don't have traces of this kind of reparations. He constructed each merlon of the battlement with a wing adding a sort of flecking wall on the left side in order that those fighting from the battlement against their attackers might never be hit by missiles thrown by those storming the wall on their left. It was like a merlon with a wing like this, so they could actually uh, mm, shoot with whatever kind of missiles or but they still were protected with this wing and it's difficult to find traces all around the, the wall of these kind of repairs and he also dug a ditch about the wall of sufficient depth to form a very important part of the of the defenses and the romans applauded the prudence of the general and especially the experience displayed in the matter of the battlement so Belisarius continued to make all his preparation because the first Gothic siege, uh, siege would come soon. And we know, again from Procopius, that the wall, the wall of the city was too long and the, the Goths could not uh, attack all the entire circuit. So they uh, surrounded only about one half of the wall with their army. In the meantime, Belisarius Arans tried to defend only, um, not all, the, because there were too many, uh, the, that's the most problem, the, the walls were too long, too long at too many doors. And uh, all, during all the sieges of Rome, these were always the problem. And therefore, they tried to attack only from one side or another side. And from the inside, they tried to protect the wall, but only some gates, no, not all the gates. And, um, and also, Procopius uh, 
tells us, the talks about the machines they used. Vitiges uh, was planning an assault and he constructed wooden towers equal in height to the enemy's wall. Wheels were attached to the floor of these towers under each corner and the towers were drawn by oxen yoked together. On the other side, Belisarius placed upon the towers machines which they call balliste. Balliste is the Latin name. They placed other machines along the parapet of the wall to throw stones against the enemy. Of course, the higher was the tower and the greater would be the effectiveness of these stones, projectiles, or whatever was shot by these balliste. And the battles took place um, mostly all around this mausoleum. I've talked about this huge mausoleum, which was enclosed inside uh, uh, the wall and used as a bulwark. And now this, uh, very, this, this account, Procopius' account, is very important also uh, to better understand what happened to Rome's uh, Roman monuments. In this case, the mausoleum is well known as Castel Sant'Angelo, but Procopius, but Procopius refers that during the Gothic Wars, the mausoleum was still, was still impressive, it was completely covered by white marble blocks, and it had lots of sculptures, huge sculptures, all around and on top of the mausoleum, depicting horses and men. And those sculptures were, unfortunately, used by Belisarius, and we know this from Procopius, as stones. Um, and I quote, for a short time the consternation fell upon them, is referring to um, Byzantine army. But afterwards, by common agreement, they broke in pieces the most of the statues, which were very large, and they threw them down with both hands upon the heads of the enemies. And that's the reason why we don't have sculptures anymore on top of the Adrian's mausoleum, unfortunately. But, okay, this is the first siege, lasted for one year. After this siege, the wall withstood attacks and succeeded in defending the city. And Rome remained under control of Belisarium. But we don't have time to continue with this history. We have lots of uh, different sacks, uh, sieges. The wall sometimes succeeded, sometimes not in defending the city. Uh, Rome kept going back and forth uh, in the hands of Byzantines, uh, sometimes, uh, or uh, goats. Uh, Belisarius had to fight against another enemy, Totila, the new king of goats. And uh, Totila destroyed uh, Rome, and also Procopius tells us that he destroyed a third of the wall, even if uh, scholars are now skeptical about this number because a third of the wall probably it's a little bit too much. But of course it destroyed some sections of the wall. And the last siege and definitive siege was guided by Narses against Totila. Once again it was fought, uh, fight, they fought um, close by and inside the mausoleum. And uh, once again, Procopius says that uh, uh, the gods were reduced to a small number and um, the, the gods were no longer able to guard the whole circuit of the wall of Rome. And therefore, Totila enclosed a small part of the city within a short wall around the tomb of Edrian. At the very end, Narses placed all the ladders against the wall without any opposition because all the gods were inside the mausoleum, so the entire wall was completely mm, alone, <laughs> abandoned. And um, pla uh, placed the ladders against the wall without any opposition and with no trouble got inside the fortifications with his followers and they opened the gates and they at their leisure. At the end, the gods surrounded both themselves and the fortress. Rome was captured and Narses immediately sent for the last time the keys of its gates to the Emperor Justinian. What I wanted to show you and uh, talking about the Gothic War is that the walls of Rome have been continuously 
restored, even if they had become unnaturally extended, and even if it was so difficult to protect Rome, the walls were and remained always um, important for everyone. And the, for the fortification system was built to protect a huge capital, but because of barbaric attacks and wars, um, there was a demographic collapse. And many parts of the city were abandoned. The center of the city receded, and the perimeter and the wall stood utterly immobile and completely isolated and it remained isolated for mo many 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 centuries the actually the the, the, the city was um, all around uh, not the um, uh, how can i say you it's all, it's close by st peter cathedral actually and in that part but we had lots of uh, Mm, sector of the city inside the wall completely abandoned until the 19th century, until the new construction of the new capital of the new Italy. And uh, but but the importance of that seems very weird to me that the city was there and not in the Palatine. And no, the Palatine completely deserted. The Palatine was abandoned. Um, when the emperor did not live anymore in Rome, and it happened during the fourth century. Wow. No, during the third, actually. Uh, they changed the capital. First Ravenna, no, first Milan, and then Ravenna. And the Palatine, the Palatine was abandoned forever, starting from the Gothic Wars, actually, the sixth century, but also the, for the Roman Forum, the Imperial Forum, were sometimes abandoned, other times they changed their function. For instance, it, temples were uh, occupied by churches, and, uh, but uh, the, the city center was uh, the area, the, the area nearby the new uh, Christianized uh, neighborhood. So St. Peter, St. Paul, St. John's. Which is kind of weird because actually it's outside of the walls. Uh, no, some Peter was, was out. Uh, yeah, 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 was some, outside. Some square, you know, let's say the yeah, is and what is it also? It, it's also strange that that part of Rome was also difficult to live because of the Tiber, because of the river. I don't know the English for uh, esondazione, floating. No, floating. Yeah. Floating. Floating the f uh, was a serious problem, but they still lived there, and that. That, w that is the, the, the reason why we don't know the um, ancient Rome in that neighborhood because we have the urban expansion, we have the urban construction out, out on top of the ancient monuments. So we can see the Colosseum and the Palatine Hill because no, because no one lived there. Wow. That's, That's the problem of the continuity <laughs> inside uh, an ancient city. Where they continue to live, uh, you cannot see any kind of monument anymore because they built on top of the ancient monument. Um, but the wall is still, is still there now, today, because the importance of the wall continued to grow and never ceased. And uh, during the 6th century, uh, actually during the first cent uh, uh, beginning from the 1st century, the walls were Christianized. In Rome, uh, we have now the Christian religion and not anymore the paganism and uh, they started build uh, churches inside and sanctuaries outside the wall and in order to reach these sanctuaries outside the wall they have to exit from the main gates of the walls and thus these gates were Christianized too changing the name from the Latin names to the Christian name and so we had St. Paul Gate, and St. Sebastian Gate, and St. Lawrence Gate, and so on. So the, all in, the, the wall had this kind of holiness, okay? <laughs> and also, what is also interesting is that uh, the sanctuaries outside the wall um, as have still now, in, in their proper name, the connection with the walls. So even today, we talk about St. Lawrence outside walls. The name is still the same because there was, there was this 
strong connection between sanctuaries and walls. The walls were like a threshold in order to go, in order to reach the holy sanctuaries outside the city. And a new tradition of papal involvement in maintaining the walls of Rome began during the 7th and 8th century AD. But this is the beginning of another story, and this is where our story ends. We started with a big city without walls, a, big, a capital of an empire, um, which did not require any kind of protection because the, the Roman Empire provided the protection for the capital. And where, in Rome there were all kinds of monuments and um, forums, basilicas, amphitheaters were the essence of the city. This classical urbanism represented the city until the 3rd century AD. But during three centuries, third, fourth, five, six, during three centuries, four centuries, the situation com changed completely, and now walls became the essence of the city. Not any more forums or uh, basilicas or amphitheater, but only walls, because all the cities, but not only Rome, but all the cities, in order to be considered cities, they, have, they had to have walls. See, the name, the word na um, walls and city had the same meaning. Super true. <laughs> okay. And uh, even if they wanted to represent the city, they could use the walls, only the walls. You can see here, it's, most, it's relevant. It's very curious, this kind of representation of Rome in the Middle Age, the beginning of the Middle Age. They wanted to represent Rome. They could represent Rome by using the wall. They always represented Rome using its walls. But in this case, they wanted to represent the power for Rome. And therefore, they decided to represent Rome by uh, depicting its wall and giving to, the, to its wall this shape of a power li powerful lion. So now the process in, yeah, it's a lion. <laughs> and the process, the process is complete now. The walls, a city without walls now is represented only thanks to, the, to its walls. The last the last wall, um, event where the walls played a role as a protector, so they uh, function in defend the city, um, was in, at the end of 19th century, uh, during the last siege, siege uh, that Rome had for, in order to conquer the city. Uh, this is the famous uh, Porta Pia Bridge. After hours and hours of cannonades, the uh, Italian army succeeded in entering the city, and this, this was the fi final defeat of the Papal States and unification of the Italian peninsula. Once again, walls were one of the main characters of this story. And to conclude, I would like to mention again uh, uh, Antonio Snippy's wall, words. These walls testified more than anything else both the Roman power and weakness, and I hope to have shown you how those words are true, because now it's still it's impossible to um, distinguish what is inside and what is outside the walls you can still admire because the walls because the walls are still there the walls are still in rome and they still they continue and i hope they will continue to magnify and represent the city thank you very much for your attention Yeah. losing their supply of water. So was that a problem or was there some other Is It was a problem actually, but uh, first of all, uh, the 
concern of the, I, I will show you the picture, which is easier, I, I hope. Uh, the first concern was to protect the aqueducts inside the city in order to um, guarantee uh, the water supply inside the city during sieges. Mm -hmm. Of course, they also had to administer aqueducts outside the city and they continued to send um, administrators and uh, workers in order to always control the water supplies. And I think that uh, um, it happened during the sieges that they tried to block, uh, the attackers tried to block the aqueducts all around the city in order to not let the water enter inside and it would be a, a problem for the uh, citizens inside the city but uh, thanks to uh, the way they build the aqueduct and the wall together they always succeed in avoid this kind of uh, attack but of course there was this huge problem in control the outside part of the aqueduct but I yeah, they were they mm, they did it uh, very well because uh, they always co they they continue to have water uh, and they still continue to have water from this non old dig up because Rome had twelve aqueducts something like that but two of them of for sure are still on, in function of course we do not mm, use them uh, for our life but they are still in function for fountains public fountains so they did it very well. Okay. The walls when they were building them, was it a planned like project? I mean it sounds like it was uh build as you go, if you came across something you incorporated it or Yeah. I they didn't like plan out say this is a route we're gonna have, we're gonna go around these things. It's like they just as they went, they would incorporate Okay, I think that there was a plan uh, because uh, not probably if you look at the shape, it's very strange. And that's because it's not because it's casual, it's the contrary. Uh, according to me, it's exactly the contrary. It, they had this shape because they planned what to let inside and what to leave outside the wall. For instance, they have to protect this part here uh, because there was another aqueduct and so they had to go, he, even if they could only use the Tiber as a defense, uh, they wanted to reach all this part because they had um, lots of uh, public monuments and aqueducts and water supplies and um, urban infrastructure here in order to defend. So they planned to arrive here. They wanted to protect here. Also here, this kind of uh, strange shape. It's because there there was aqueducts again, so they had to protect them. And they also think that they decided to plan the, um, the, the walls because they wanted to, in order to save money, they had to use uh, imperial properties because the imperial, they, they did not have to pay to build the, um, the walls inside imperial properties. So what is also important to say is that they tried to let the walls pass through the imperial properties because if the walls would pass, to pass through the pro private proper properties, they had to pay the private owner in order to let the wall pass through its properties. So I think that they tried to plan, they tried uh, its be their best in order to plan, <laughs> in order to let the city continue to live. Because they did not how to do, because Rome never had walls since this uh, exp urban expansion. So they did not how to do a proper fortification system in this big big city without boundaries but it was very difficult so they tried their best but I think that there was a, a plan we don't know if Aurelian uh, uh, was directly involved in this kind of planification of the it just delegated someone else we don't know about it so you don't know if there was like an actual document that showed the 
we have no we have only um, historians accounts from about uh, emperors but uh, the historia augusta is the name of the this work about the emperors about aurelian but the problem is that during the late antiquity historians are not uh, impartial in referring about referring about emperors so <laughs> the the we don't know how much is true and how much is influenced by the personal, uh, I mean, way to mm, we'll think. Survive. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we don't have we don't have um, an official document about the plan. No, unfortunately not. But we can uh, guess that just looking at the. The, ch the choice is just looking at how they did this wall. It was curious, but the fact is that uh, thanks to these uh, mm, unusual decisions, we can more, it's easier for us to uh, understand what they wanted to do. If they only had the circle around, it was maybe more difficult to understand. <laughs> um, um, I'm curious, you know, thing that I found very, very interesting is the abandonment yeah. of the of the old city that we actually consider the ancient Rome and you said like in the fourth fourth century was abandoned. Completely. So kind of first time that I, I hear something like that is really, really interesting to me. And I can it's it seems to me that these traces of abandonment are still visible in the, in the actual modern city because, you know, I think this, uh, this corner, uh, the bottom corner, this strange shape is the Appian neighborhood yeah. of the Appian Way, right? And still there is no very much in there. And maybe in, the, in Imperial Rome this was an important area because it was decided to include that part yeah. inside of the city. Yeah, it was important again because of uh, Actually, again, because of the aqueducts, and if I think oh, really? about it, because we had, yeah, <laughs> and was everywhere. But uh, uh, it was also important because we had uh, imperial properties, so they could use again imperial properties there, and there was a lot of important tombs here. Tombs. Yeah, and what is also important, I did not say it, but what is also important to say is that for a Roman law, it was forbidden to build inside walls to build them, sorry, to bury inside the walls, oh, okay, bury, bury. bury yeah, it's, it is not possible to have tombs inside the city of Rome, which was a problem because Rome did not have boundaries, so it was very difficult to decide where is the city and where is not the city, but suburbs. It so why did you decide to put tombs when, inside? Because there are a lot of tombs in that area. Yeah. Because uh, there were emperors in, or very Yeah. Important. Yeah, actually, yeah, mm, because it, uh, there, is a l there were lots of laws uh, which protected tombs and you could not destroy a tomb, but during this period it was difficult to uh, follow rules because bar barbarians' attacks were so prominent that they didn't care about tombs, actually. <laughs> okay, they're already dead. We have to survive. <laughs> I have a very naive question. It's about the holes when in the honorium uh, yeah. wall, right? Why did they not cover it? You know, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know building and then... But know. if you look at the um, aspect... <laughs> This, allora, uh, they didn't cover because they didn't have time to cover it. It was not important to cover it. But uh, if you look closely uh, at the monuments in Rome, uh, you can catch lots of monuments, even the Pantheon, uh, which is yeah, one of yeah, the most yeah. important, with holes. Uh, the difference is that uh, for the important monuments, uh, temples uh, or forums, after they construct, they use scaffolding. But after the construction, they covered holes by putting marbles Marble. block, yeah, marble blocks like Colosseum and so on. In this case, the marble is so expensive, right. <laughs> so it was completely unuseless to use marble or whatever to cover the wall. It had to protect the city, not to be beautiful. So <laughs> they only lived, and maybe they also could use holes for reparations 
they could do put scaffolding uh, used also for maintenance of the wall so it was all, it also had uh, function. function yeah i guess yeah, can I ask you a question? Um, so um, it interests me to think about what um, is naturally defensible yeah. and what is not naturally yeah. defensible, how topography helps, how topography helps. So I've read before that the reason the city of Rome grows up is because Tiger Island is an important portage mm -hmm. and the Capitoline Hill dominates it. So naturally, we fortify the Capitoline Hill to control that portage, and that becomes the nucleus of the city. So that's a very small feature in topography in comparison with Constantinople, where you have a very uh, a large area where the topography aids the defense. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it makes me think that um, Rome grows around a very small natural fortress. And when you build walls later, it's simply to protect the urban population. But the large Roman walls, really, they're not aided by the topography. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So Rome's very different from Constantinople. Yeah. Constantinople logically is always the same for a, lo a large population. Rome, the large population is very awkward in terms of defense. Do you think that's correct? Yes, I think that uh, uh, Rome actually has natural defenses, had natural defenses such as uh, the hills, but uh, they lost this natural, it, it lost these natural defenses and in the moment they spread all around and so the hills were only neighborhood. And uh, they, uh, when they build uh, the Aurelian Wall, uh, which also gave an example for Constantinople's walls. So there is also this, there are many studies about the connections between the two capitals, uh, the Eastern Empire capitals and the Western uh, uh, Rome, of course, uh, and how Rome uh, did influence also Constantinople for the construction of the walls. Uh, but when they uh, decided to build, uh, uh, I'm trying to, to build uh, the city, I don't, I don't, bah bah. <laughs> uh, natural defenses were used, but uh, such as the Tiber, but uh, uh, they wanted to protect uh, what, what was built uh, with the walls without, car without using natural defenses, actually, uh, during the, the imperial time. So it sounds like Rome is a great place yeah. for a small city and a lousy place for a big city. Yeah, and, they, uh, uh, and it was difficult to manage this big city. Sorry? It was difficult to manage this big city. It was very difficult uh, in administrative way. There were regions, 14 regions, administrative in regions and uh, neighborhood, administrative neighborhoods. And uh, even if when they, um, okay, even if they went build the, um, the walls, they had to cut out some of these neighborhoods. So it's, it was very difficult to plan and to decide what dessert to let inside, uh, to rest inside the walls and what not. Um, because, and they, some, some scholars suggested that they decided to give this kind of shape to the city because of um, re religious stuff, because there was this uh, religious line called Pomerium, and uh, they think that it's, it's a difficult matter. They think that they also could have followed this religious line, but it's very an ancient kind of relig religious line. So it's difficult that during the third century AD, they still were concerned in uh, maintaining this uh, religious line, uh, which uh, r had a, an effective, um, had a role only during, until the, the Republican period or the beginning of the empire. So, and they also say that they could use this kind of shape because of, uh, uh, the control of um, food and uh, come si dice cinta daziaria? 
uh, Dazio. Uh, they put some, they, there were some gates all around the city. S gates uh, which controlled the taxes on top. Taxes on, uh, exactly, the items. Uh, in order to control what kind of items the could and the city were taxed. Okay. And they, they have to go exactly. through certain gates. Duties? Yeah. That's what? Duties. Duties. Taxes or duties. Duties, okay. And this kind of doors, this kind of way to control duties were uh, even before, also before the, the walls, okay. And some scholars suggested that they want to build the walls where those kind of doors were already, okay, in order to control those kind of taxes and duties, uh, also thanks to the door, it was easier because they had to pass through a gate with their duties. Pay tax, you can pass. Okay. So they also, so, so it's very, very, it's um, interesting but difficult to let, um, put together all the different reasons why they decided to construct the bill like that. It's because there are many, many, many kind of different. Uh, possibilities. <laughs> and all those are correct, according to me. So maybe the last question? Or maybe a couple of questions, yeah. Just, the Vatican Archives, were you able to access the information in the Vatican Archives? Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't know. The Vatican, the Roman Catholic yeah. Church Archives, is there data there that you would like to be able to access? Or have you the Vatican Archive? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It depends on uh, what kind of documents you want to read. Ah, inside the Vatican archives? Yes, I went there, but uh, documents I had to um, um, read were um, possible unopen access documents. I don't know if it's possible to enter and consult and read all kind of documents. For an archaeologist, uh, there are lots of documents um, open access, and they also want to put online lots of documents, so it will be even easier in the future, I hope. <laughs> it's a beautiful place, the Vatican Archives, actually. It's really beautiful. Uh, taking the whole thing, and there's a little bit outside your field, but when you look at the whole history of the walls, yeah. do you think the Romans could have saved money and gotten more security by giving the Goths a legal work status and a path uh. citizenship? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. I'm just curious. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, I have to um, say, se sarebbe stato più facile invece di fare tutti questi assedi dare direttamente la cittadinanza ai gotti ah, <ride> yeah. questo questi di lavoro no? preferendo se la sede adesso ok, I get it it could be easier you to, your v-status still is up yeah. for review <laughs> you don't have to go out and write the okay. okay. alright, then Saturday and give us the answer <laughs> thank you okay, uh, thank you okay, uh, Thank you. Thank you.